Uh, it is my pleasure to invite the Professor Thomas Buck and uh, to have a chance to take a beautiful lectures. And I would like to thank to Professor Jay Young. Uh, he is the former president of IUSS. Uh, he helped us to making these lectures. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Donald Spark is uh, the most, one of the most uh, important and uh, valuable uh, scholar in soil science. And uh, he is uh, now director of Delaware Environmental Institute, uh, University of Delaware. And he served as uh, president of IUSS, International Union of Soil Science, and uh, Society of Soil Science of America, and uh, he has received uh, two important medal. One is uh, Ruby Medal, uh, dubbed by the IUSS, and the Geochemistry Medal uh, by the American Chemical Societies. Uh, also, he is very important and very famous. The also, the book of chemistry, such as environmental soil chemistry and the kinetics of soil chemical processes. Uh, it is great. Uh, again, I have a very happy, I am so happy to introduce Donald Sparks. Please welcome to you a big hand. Thank you. So uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, you very much for inviting me to uh, come to Korea uh, University today to talk about a very important topic. Um, I'm going to talk about the connection between soil and water and food and climate. And while I'm going to talk a lot about the, the challenges that we face um, in those areas, I also want you to view it as a lot of opportunities that we in the soil science and the environmental science have to help address some of these major challenges that we're facing. And I hope you'll see as the presentation goes on that all of these areas connect with each other. So they're very tightly connected in what we might call a nexus. So in many cases, people talk about this particular period in, in history as the Anthropocene, the idea that, that humans are having a major impact upon the planet Earth. Um, and human activity, as you see, will, has transformed between a third and a half of the land that we live on. Uh, many of the world's rivers have been dammed or diverted. We're now producing more nitrogen than we're fixing naturally, and we use more than a half of the world's accessible fresh water. So I'm going to talk this morning about a number of important environmental challenges that we face and try to show you the, the connection between those. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about population expansion, which is closely related to food security and insecurity, uh, water Quantity and quality is a major uh, challenge that we're facing in the world. Also, air quality issues uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, my group does a lot on soil contamination, so I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that we have there, but also the opportunities, uh, particularly with respect to a lot of new technologies that are available to help us address soil contamination. And of course, climate change, uh, we're all observing climate change. It's occurring all over the world, and this is a major challenge. I won't really talk about energy sustainability, but it's closely connected to these other areas. And of course, biodiversity is a big concern. So this is a, um, this is a photo of the world looking at night, at lights around the world. And you can see that um, in many parts of the world, North America, parts of, 
of certainly Europe, Western Europe, parts of Asia, where you're located here. Um, there are large uh, population increases. We have about uh, nine, uh, seven and a half billion people on the planet today. And that number is projected to rise to nine to nine and a half billion by 2050. And some projections are by 2100, we'll be up to 11 billion people. And while you see darker periods in parts of Africa and, and South America, uh, those are areas that are also going to see large increases in population. So we have a lot of people on, on the planet in which we have to feed. One of the things that um, certainly you're seeing in Asia, uh, but also we're seeing in many other parts of the world, is increased urbanization. More and more people are moving to cities. Um, and it's been estimated that at the end of the 21st century, over 80% of the world's population will live in urban areas. And so we're, we're creating these very large mega cities. Uh, Seoul, of course, is very large. There are many others around the world. And in many parts of the world, this is creating more problems because of lack of, of good quality water, uh, health care. Uh, of course, climate change is, is exacerbating a lot of the problems because we have extreme weather events, flooding and droughts, and things related to sanitation. Uh, this is a, a map of uh, showing you Bangladesh, which is one of the lowest lying countries in the world. And in this country, of course, a lot of issues related to sea level rise, population, large population centers, uh, particularly along the coastal areas. Water, um, this is one of the big challenges that we face, not only the quantity of water, but also the quality of water. Uh, this is a, a figure, a table taken from a, a paper by um, Gleick. And if you look at the, these, these data, you see that uh, most of the water on the planet is in the oceans and the seas and the bays. So it's not, it's saline water. It's not necessarily potable water. Um, if we look at groundwater, which is the major source of drinking water for many people throughout the world, you can see it's a very small percentage, about 1.7%. And of this, um, you can see uh, the majority of it, the fresh water is, is much lower, 0.76, whereas saline water is 0.93. So a lot of issues, again, that are being uh, made worse by climate change with respect to water. So we can talk about shades of water, uh, three shades of water. First of all, of course, the, the blue water is the water that we use a lot for drinking purposes. Um, it's in the lakes, rivers. It's used for water in our homes, for irrigation purposes, for agriculture. Green water is water that's very important. It's in the soil. Uh, it's available for plants, absorbed by roots. And there are a lot of efforts being made to try to, to, to uh, make sure that we have more of this green type of water. And then I think this is an area that we're going to have to explore more and more, how we can use gray water, uh, water that has been previously used. It may contain some impurities. Um, wastewater that's discharged, how we can make better use of the so-called gray water uh, to make it available for a human consumption. So there's the problem of quantity of water, but there's also a problem of quality of water. And so we have in many parts of the world uh, deterioration of, of water quality due to pollution, uh, due to a particularly oversupply of nutrients, uh, things like nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and we get these, these types of conditions where we get uh, hypoxia, low oxygen levels, so we get algal growth, um, fish kills occur. Uh, this is a problem we have a lot in the United States, uh, particularly along the eastern coast, uh, where we have a lot of population. We have a lot of agriculture. We get oversupply of nutrients into water, and we get these sorts of conditions occurring. Um, 
last year, this is a, a map showing you the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and you can see these very red areas um, are areas where we have very low levels of oxygen. So this was one of the most, one of the lowest levels of oxygen ever recorded uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, showing that there was tremendous um, amounts of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, that had gone into the water, causing these very low levels of oxygen. So this is a, a big problem that we face in the United States, but it's a problem that uh, many of the countries are dealing with. Uh, just to give you some examples, I've been to China many times, and of course China is dealing um, with a lot of issues related to water quality. Uh, as their economy has grown and the farmers are able to purchase fertilizer and so forth, uh, there's a lot of excess nutrients that are going on the land and it's ending up in the water. So you can see uh, contamination of algae in, in lake areas. Um, so, so a lot of problems related to, to water quality. Now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about climate issues because these are affecting everything else that I'm going to talk about. Um, I think most of you know that the CO2 levels have been increasing significantly since the Industrial Revolution. So we're now uh, above 400 parts per million. And in many cases, uh, this is ant looking at Antarctic uh, temperatures, you can see a very close correlation between temperature and CO2 levels. So this is uh, affecting a lot of things, a lot of things that we all have to deal with in terms of food production, in terms of, of water, in terms of uh, a better way of life that we're having to deal with. And in many cases, these levels, even if we were, we were to sort of completely control the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, these levels could persist for many decades. So even if we stopped putting all the, the fossil fuels into the atmosphere, we're still dealing with very high levels of CO2. So you can see that uh, the concentration has risen more than a third in the past 200 years. Uh, and you can see that the United States and China are the two major culprits in terms of adding uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. China is producing about 28% of the global total, and the United States is producing about 16%. Not only is CO2 an issue, but we have to deal with other greenhouse gases like methane. Um, the concentration of this is more than doubled. And if in a few more decades, we could have CO2 levels that have not been seen since 15 million years ago. So this is a huge issue. I, I think it's, um, in many respects, it's, it's sort of the defining issue of this century uh, that we're having to deal with. <clears throat> um, in the last few years, we've had the hottest um, average temperature uh, that we've ever observed before on planet Earth. This is looking in 2015. Um, 2016 was even warmer. Uh, this is a very recent uh, figure taken out of the New York Times, and they've looked at the, the changes in temperature uh, over a period of from 1951 to 1980, and you can see these very dark areas is where they've, we've observed the largest increases in temperature. In some cases up to 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit, 3 degrees centigrade. So you can see a lot of that temperature increase is occurring in the polar and the Arctic regions where we're having these large ice melts, uh, which is causing then the seas to rise in other parts of the world. Um, so this is, this is a, a big, big problem. Um, this is looking at how the, the monthly temperatures have been above or below normal. This is, so we're looking from 51 to 2006, so you could see constant rise in these temperatures, uh, and in some cases, this, this difference is, is quite significant. And so 2016 was the first time that the hottest year occurred three times in a row. Okay, so 
So we're seeing increasing temperatures, uh, which are going to have big effects on uh, crop production, all the things that we're, we're concerned about. Uh, this is just a picture taken out of National Geographic showing you uh, one of the glaciers in West Antarctica, so you can see a lot of the, the melting uh, that's occurring. So with this melting of the ice and the rising temperatures, uh, we're seeing more and more impacts of sea level rise, which is a big problem because as more and more people are moving to urban areas, and many of the people of the world are moving to coastal regions where the seas are rising. You can see that uh, in Australia, for example, more than 85% of the population lives along the coast. In the United States, we're up above 50%. Uh, Brazil is greater than 50%, and then globally, it's, it's 44%. Um, I was just in Late January, I went to the Maldives, which, as you know, is off the coast of Sri Lanka. And this is Mali, the capital of Maldives. Maldives is the lowest lying country in the world. So they're seeing huge impacts of, of um, climate change and sea level rise. This city, for example, they're estimating they'll have to vacate the city in a few more decades because of, of the increase in, in the seas. In China, for example, 60% uh, of the population live in 12 provinces, and in Asia alone, uh, we have about, you have about 60% live within 400 kilometers of the coast. So these things are all connected as seas are rising, more people are moving to the coast, uh, we're going to see more and more uh, impacts of this. I'll just give you an example in the United States, in, in 2012, we had a tropical storm. It was not even a hurricane, so it was a tropical storm that moved up the east coast of the United States and caused devastation on New York City, a population of about 8 million people, and uh, northern New Jersey. This is a picture of Manhattan, New York City, and this is the upper part of New York, which had lights, and the lower part of Manhattan was completely dark. All the power was shut down because of a tropical storm. It was not even a hurricane. Um, and this is an example of along the coast of New Jersey. This was a roller coaster that was actually carried out into to the ocean. Um, these are the subways of New York. They had never been flooded in over 100 years. So the subways were flooded. Um, this, these are taxi cabs in New York. So there were huge damage um, in the city of New York due to uh, this tropical storm. But in that area, of course, along the east coast, the seas are rising at a much greater level than in other parts of the world. So they're projected to rise over a meter uh, by 2100. So along the east coast of the United States, we have major cities, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, Washington, Boston. Uh, these are major population areas. The other thing that's being observed in our country along the coast is we're seeing more salinity. So we're seeing saltwater intrusion uh, into these coastal areas, which is having an impact upon plant crop production. So this is an example in my own state of Delaware where ditches are being dug to try to prevent this, this salt water from uh, getting into plants. And this shows you some damage to corn crop uh, just due to uh, the salinity uh, that's, that's coming in um, as a result of the, the rising seas. So one of the things that is of great interest um, particularly along many of these coastal areas, and this is true in, in my country, um, we have a lot of old industrial sites. And these industrial sites uh, produced a lot of uh, pollutants, chemicals, inorganic chemicals, organic chemicals. And so the question is, uh, what will be the impact of sea level rise upon the cycling of these contaminants. This is the state of Delaware where I live. It's a small state along the Atlantic Ocean. 
And then in this part of the state, we've had a lot of industry. So there's a lot of heavily contaminated soils. And so my group, and you can see these projections for, for sea level rise. The, 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 if we have one meter of inundation, you can see the effect of that up to one and a half. And so what, what uh, we're doing in my research group is we're trying to understand how increasing sea level rise and salinity is going to impact the cycling of things like arsenic and chromium, for example. So a lot of these sites have large quantities of arsenic and chromium. So this is just a, a cartoon that shows you um, the impact of salinity, particularly here we're looking at arsenic. So we have soils that have large amounts of arsenite and arsenate. And those of you who know about the chemistry of, of arsenic, we know we can oxidize arsenic-3 to arsenic-5, which is a more um, oxidized form. It's less mobile in the soil, whereas arsenite is very mobile. So we're interested in understanding how does this sea level rise, flooding, inundation, how does it affect the chemistry, the redox chemistry of arsenic? So we've been doing laboratory experiments using these um, biogeochemical microcosms where we can bring polluted soil into the laboratory. We can very accurately control pH, um, redox potential, and we can take samples over um, a range of redox potentials, a range of pH, analyze the solution, and then we can take solid samples and we take these to the uh, synchrotron facilities. You have a synchrotron in Korea uh, where we can understand in the whole soil what the chemistry of that um, arsenic is under different redox conditions. So we've tried to simulate the, the total amount of arsenic under using river water, which is less saline, and seawater, which is much more obviously high salinity. And this shows you the, the total arsenic as a range of EHs. And sort of surprisingly, we saw less arsenic release under seawater than we did with river water. And we could explain this because in these soils, most of the arsenic was in an occluded oxide. So they were primarily in iron and aluminum oxides, rather than being arsenate absorbed onto the surface. And with the seawater, we had high levels of sulfate. And the sulfate was binding to the surface and basically inhibiting the dilution or the dissolution of the arsenic in solution. So we can monitor solution arsenic. Um, and then we can take the experiments to the synchrotron and we can look at the change in arsenic speciation, whether it's arsenate, arsenite, over a range of EHs and then follow that. And so what you can see, these are X-ray absorption near-edge structure data. Um, obviously, as we become more uh, anoxic, we see more arsenite. With oxic, we see more arsenate. And we see that under the, um, the seawater conditions, more of the arsenic is staying as arsenate rather than arsenite. So these are kinds of experiments that we can do to, to try to look at how sea level rise is impacting the cycling of some of these, these very uh, toxic materials like arsenic. Another impact of climate change, which I think often we don't think about, is, is national, in, national and international security. Because um, with climate change and these more, these, um, more cyclical, episodic kinds of, of climate change events that we occur in terms of drought and flooding and so forth, there are going to be issues related to food shortages, water crises, pollution. Um, a lot of the military bases in the world are located along the coast. So there's going to be impacts upon military bases as we have more flooding and, and rise of seas. Uh, as we see more melting in the Arctic regions, in the polar regions, this is going to open up shipping channels. 
the discovery of oil, gas, rare minerals. This is going to create conflicts between nations. Um, so there's going to be dip diplomacy events occurring. So all sorts of things um, related to national security. So I think you can see how climate is affecting everything. It's affecting populations, it's affecting security, it's affecting water. Uh, it's basically affecting our, our way of life and our sustainability as a human population. Uh, this is just a picture of a, of a town in, in, um, in Greenland. This was all at one point completely frozen over. It's now melted and they're discovering a lot of rare earth minerals uh, in the sea area. So just showing you the, the impact of effects of climate. Now I want to move a little bit to soils and, and how soils affect climate change. Because most of you know that soils are a major sequester of carbon. There's a lot of carbon in soils. It's a major source of carbon. Um, if we look at these different soil orders, you can see large amounts of, of carbon in some of these things like inceptosols, histosols, molosols, intosols um, are sequestering a lot of carbon. But we don't really understand what is the impact of climate change on soils. This is an area that's just starting where researchers are starting to look at this. Um, it's, it's difficult to assess because soils, as all of you know, are very complex. And so we have a lot of chemical heterogeneity, a lot of physical heterogeneity, a lot of biological heterogeneity. Um, we're also dealing with large scales in soils, spatial scales that go all the way to the atomic, to the global, temporal scales that go from very rapid reaction processes to very slow processes. Uh, so this makes the study of impacts of climate on soils uh, difficult. But these are some of the factors that, that can affect climate change. Uh, increased CO2 levels, temperature increase, these wetting and drying cycles, and of course these extreme events, storms, droughts, fires, are all will affect the the, the soil itself. Um, we know that climate with warming, we get reduction of soil carbon because we have greater microbial uh, reactivity. One of the areas that is of great interest, um, if, if we think about these, um, these soils in the Arctic region, these permafrost areas, they've sequestered large amounts of carbon. But as we get melting of these these areas, ice melting, uh, temperatures rising. Uh, it's been estimated that these, these global soils could be major emitters of carbon. So while we, we always think of soils as sequestering carbon, under certain conditions they could release a lot of carbon. So of course this is going to make the situation worse. Um, and these are some estimates of the amount of carbon that could be released. There was a very interesting article that just came out in March in Science. Uh, a group of uh, researchers uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California were looking at how does warming affect soil carbon. And so this was an article that was published. Um, and what they did is they basically took soil profiles and they put, basically they, they, they took, uh, they warmed, they put um, basically temperature sensors down into the soil where they could basically um, warm the soil to different temperatures. And they found that when the temperature went up four degrees centigrade, you can see the impact upon respiration. So they got a f very significant increase in the respiration, uh, basically the microbial activity of the soil, showing that as temperature increases, we could have loss of carbon into the atmosphere. So this is an area that I think in, in terms of soil science there will be more and more interest in trying to understand what's the effect of temperature increases 
on the sequestration of carbon. For example, um, there, there will obviously be effects on vegetation. We can have shifts in vegetation, microbial shifts. So you can see that almost every um, soil, physical, chemical, biological property can be affected with climate change impacts. They're also, again, related to climate, related to population, related to soil contamination. Um, we have impacts upon food, food security, food insecurity. What affects these? Well, climate, we've already talked a little bit about. I'll talk a little bit about soil degradation. Population, um, we're seeing rising fertilizer prices, which I'll show you some data on that. As many of the countries become more affluent, uh, there's an increasing demand for meat and dairy products, which is going to put additional stress upon food. Urban expansion. Um, in the United States, we're using more land to grow corn, for example, for biofuels. So we're taking corn, rather than using it for food, we're using it for fuel. So this is affecting the amount of the, the supply of food. Um, and, of course, uh, industrialization, urbanization. So we're talking about feeding up to 11 billion people uh, by 2100. So food security, food insecurity is, is a major problem. The United Nations has estimated that um, we could have large impacts upon food security and that because the population increase, the food may have to increase by 70%. So this is a huge percentage in the amount of food that we're going to have to produce to feed the world. And you can see just an example of meat consumption. These are data um, up to 2009 in China, for example. Uh, meat consumption has increased from 4 kilograms per year in 1961 to 58 kilograms. This is a huge increase in meat consumption just in one country. The other thing that may not be surprising to you is the amount of food that we waste. We waste large amounts of food. The United States is one of the worst in wasting food. <laughs> it's been estimated that over 50 percent of the food in the United States is wasted. Okay. So this is, this is a big, big problem um, that's making the whole food security issue worse. So in, 19, in 2010, FAO or, uh, estimated that almost a billion people are hungry. They have insufficient food. And these food prices are going to increase, so climate change again is a major factor. It's been estimated that food prices could go up 50 percent. Um, a large part of that is due to climate change. So even in the United States, which we think is a very affluent country, we have a lot of people that are hungry. Um, this was a recent uh, paper of uh, news release out of USA Today, which said there are about 50 million, 49 or 50 million people in the United States out of about 350 or so to have insufficient food. So you can imagine in, in a country like the U.S., if we have that many people, what it's like in other countries that are much less affluent. Now let me move to soils a little bit, because soils are critical in impacting security, food security, human security. This is a paper that uh, I published with some other colleagues in science. Um, in uh, 2015, where we talked about soils and human security in the 21st century. And this is uh, a very interesting uh, table that was taken out of a European Commission report, Luca Monterella, where they looked at uh, different soil threats. So you can see soil erosion, uh, organic carbon changes, nutrient imbalances, soil sealing, salinization, and they looked at, at continents, different parts of the world, and then they gave grades, basically, like 
we give students grades uh, in terms of, of the degree of, of threat. And if you look down through these tables, it's, it's a pretty pessimistic view. In many of these, um, these threats, you can see that the grades are very poor in many parts of the country. So a lot of this, we have a lot of issues related to soil. So soils play a critical role in the future of humankind in affecting all sorts of things. So I like this figure because it sort of says, okay, the earth is shrinking. The amount of land per person you can see is going down significantly. So in 1900, we had about seven hectares of surface per person. By 2050, uh, this is estimated to be down to 1.44 hectares. So we're using about one and a half Earths per year um, to provide daily needs and take up waste. And so again, the, the movement of rocks and soils by human activities, this is getting back to this Anthropocene, the impact that we as humans are having on, on planet Earth has really never been greater uh, due to population, urbanization, um, a lot of past industrial uh, activities, contaminated soil, water, natural systems. So if we just take a look at land use, for example, um, about 12% of the land of the earth is in crops. 38% uh, is used for crops and grazing. And cultivation has released, you can see, large amounts of carbon. So the idea is that we need to do everything we can to make sure the land is covered, that we don't have soil exposed that can undergo erosion and loss of carbon. And of course, Another source of CO2 has been uh, biomass burning uh, in the tropical regions. So this just shows you in the United States, for example, um, this is the ratio of urban to cropland, and you can see this, this ratio has gone up considerably. So we're seeing less and less cropland. Our best cropland is being developed. It's being used for houses, for cities, we're losing more and more of the cropland. And you can see the prime uh, cropland is, is decreased very significantly in the United States. And this is a trend that you probably are seeing in Korea. You've seen many parts of the world. It's not unique to the US. Nutrients. Um, if we look at the cost of fertilizers, they're going up significantly. Uh, phosphorus is one of those in which we, the natural supplies of phosphorus are decreasing significantly. So you can see the price of phosphorus, um, it's been going up $50 per ton. Th these are about a year or two old, so the, these, these may not be the most current numbers, but $700 per ton. Um, you know, those of us that are older, those of you that are younger in the room, sometimes you, you don't go back and you think about history, you know, you think, well, I don't need to learn about what happened 50, 100 years ago. Um, we had a president of the United States in those days. We had a president that was uh, one of our great presidents, Roosevelt. And in 1938, he made an address to Congress and he talked about soil phosphorus. I mean, this is amazing to me. I can't imagine a president of the United States or a president of any country getting up before the, legend, the Congress and talking about soil phosphorus. <laughs> But in 1938, he talked about the value of phosphorus and soils to the health and the security of the people of the nation. Okay. Potassium is another one. Um, huge increases in the cost of potassium. And so these are, these are other challenges that we're having to deal with. Uh, just some data on soil and land use. Um, you can see in the United States some data for soil erosion, not only water erosion, but wind erosion. We're losing a lot of soil, salinization, human impacts. And I like this quote very much. This is in 1933. 
this very famous um, environmentalist said that the reaction of land to occupancy, so what he was saying is how we as humans treat the land will determine the nature and the duration of our civilization. Okay, it was ma amazing. 1938, saying if we don't take care of the land, it will impact our existence. So these are just data for the United States uh, erosion. <coughs> a lot of efforts to try to keep the land covered, cover crops, no tillage agriculture, anything we can do to minimize the, the loss of soil. Another way we lose soil is through wind, wind uh, carrying dust. You encounter that in, in Korea with, with dust and affecting your air quality. We have problems in the United States, many parts of the world, air quality is getting to be a big issue. Um, this is in Arizona, in the western United States. They're seeing more and more sandstorms, much like what people see in the Middle East. Um, huge amounts of soil being carried through, through the air into causing dust storms. Uh, this is Beijing. <laughs> Many of you, if you've been to China, Beijing, you know they have huge problems with air quality. A lot of it's soil, cement, a lot of other sediments. Um, I want to talk now, toward the end of the lecture, to talk a little bit about soil contamination. Because this is another big issue that we have. Uh, particularly with some of these heavy metals like lead, cadmium, copper, zinc. A lot of areas throughout the world, and a lot of the contamination has is, is been there for decades. So I think we're getting, in many cases, much better about how we, we care for the soil in terms of contamination, but we're dealing with a lot of contamination that resulted decades ago, legacy contaminants. Um, I don't want to pick on China, but, but uh, China has a lot of contamination problems. We have a lot of problems. This was actually a report that was released by the Chinese government uh, just to show you the magnitude of, of contamination in that country. One, uh, I'm sorry, one-sixth of the land, 50 million acres is polluted. Um, crops obviously are taking up metals and also in addition to metals, a lot of impacts of pesticides and organic chemicals. So again, this is a report of the Ministry of Environmental Protection. They estimated that 16% of the soil is polluted, 19% of the farmland is polluted, and you can see these major pollutants, arsenic, cadmium, nickel. Um, you probably read a lot about uh, arsenic contamination in Southeast Asia, in Bangladesh, Cambodia. The source of that arsenic is not due to pollution, it's basically geogenic. It's the, the minerals in the soil that are high in, in arsenic. So we can have both human-induced metal contamination, but also just geogenic, uh, naturally formed minerals that are causing the pollution. So this is just shows you some of the mine runoff of a of a, um, a lake in China. So not only in China, but the United States, we have a lot of problems with soil contamination. Um, this in northern New Jersey, New Jersey's uh, on the east coast next to New York, there are huge problems with chromium. Um, I have one of my doctoral students is looking at chromium chemistry. And there's a lot of chromium-6, and if you know about the chemistry of chromium, chromium-6 is extremely toxic, and it's very mobile. So this is, this is not grass growing on this land. <laughs> this is actually chromium-6. So all of this yellow-green is chromium-6, extremely toxic. And what we're finding is, despite what we thought, most people think the chromium-6 is very mobile and it will leach out, and it does leach, but it also can be retained by the soil. So the soil can retain chromium-6. So we're trying to understand what the chemistry of that is and so forth. Um, 
This is a site that I worked, our group worked on in Belgium, uh, a large uh, contaminated site in northern Belgium. You can see it's pretty barren, nothing's growing on the land. It was heavily contaminated with zinc and lead. Um, they went in and they put metal tolerant plants on the soil on part of the site. So you can see this looks quite good compared to this. Um, they added berangite, which is a aluminosilicate. And so what we were interested in was, they were interested in what is the speciation, what is the form of chromium. So I don't want to get into all the details, but with the technology that we have today, we can use synchrotron-based X-ray absorption spectroscopy. These are extremely powerful X-rays that we can use to take a whole soil and we can determine in that soil what the major forms of a metal are. So this is looking at, um, this is the non-treated soil. So this is looking at different, different regions. Uh, the, the red is iron, um, the green is copper, and the blue is zinc. So those of you who are soil scientists, you can see we're dealing with square hundred micron areas. There's a lot of heterogeneity, not surprising. In very small areas, you can see big differences in how these, these um, metals are distributed. So this makes it, of course, difficult when we try to devise remediation strategies. But we can use these x-rays and we can go to these different regions and then we can do data analysis and we can determine what form the zinc is in. Is the zinc sorbed onto, say, oxides? Is it a mineral phase of zinc? These were old smelter sites. So here are the data, and a lot, of the a lot of the zinc is in a mineral form, so you would expect that to be less bioavailable. Um, and we also found that we have a lot of zinc in these so-called layer double hydroxide phases, which my group has worked on for over 20 years. This is a good thing, because once these phases form, the zinc and metals like nickel and cobalt are very sequestered and very little bioavailability. So again, just showing you the advantages of taking some of the analytical techniques that we have available to make decisions about, okay, do we need to remediate? If we are going to remediate, what type of remediation should we use? So let me end. I, I hope that you're not so depressed after the end of this lecture that you say it's hopeless. We've got so many problems, I don't know how we're ever going to solve them. I don't want you to feel that way. I think we have large opportunities, those of us in the scientific community, we have large opportunities to try to make the world a better place, to try to address some of these challenges. They're difficult, but they're not insurmountable. And so you as particularly younger scientists, I think have a great opportunity to help address some of these, these problems that I talked about this morning. And one of the ways that we have to do that is um, we have to work together. So we in soil science have to work with people in engineering, in chemistry, physics, we also have to work with social scientists, uh, economists, and sociologists, because we can do the greatest science in the world, but if we can't change people's behavior, then we're not successful. So we have to, we talk, we have to work, disciplines have to work together. And that's where I think a lot of the successes are going to occur in affecting change. We also have to work with policymakers, with politicians, uh, to help, help them understand. And so one of the things that I tell my students, and I think it's true of all of us, we have to not only talk to each other about our science, but we have to get out into the community. We have to educate people in our towns, in our cities, about these problems and what we can do to solve them. And why it's important for countries to provide funding to do research to try to help solve these problems. 
it sounds like in Korea you have fairly good funding for research. In the United States, we have less and less money all the time for, for research. Um, so we're going to have to go to social media like blogs and, and uh, Twitter and all these other social media ways to try to educate the public about why we all need to work together to address these problems, which are difficult, but we can help make them better. So uh, with that, um, I just acknowledge a lot of the funding sources for their research. And um, this is the group of students and postdocs that I currently have working with me. So with that, I'll conclude, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.